Hey everyone, welcome to Wiki University, the podcast that dives down the rabbit hole of Wikipedia in an effort to explore the sum of all human knowledge. I am your professor, Kyle Berseth, and as always, I'm joined by the kid who cannot get enough extra credit, Jason Nunez. I'm all, I'm all extra. You know me. I'm extra all the time. You're credit. <laughs> okay. Thank you, thank you, Professor Kyle, for that lovely introduction. Folks, I want to thank you first and foremost for joining us today. Thank you for liking and subscribing. And please, uh, just a friendly reminder to review us on YouTube or Spotify or wherever you listen to this lovely video podcast. Watch the podcast or listen to it, that is. Do people do reviews on YouTube? Is that a, considered a comment? They will. Yeah, that, I think that's a good way of putting it. You review it. What do you mean? That's a thumbs up, thumbs down. That's oh, the review. Thumbs up, thumbs down. Yeah. Siskel and Ebert style. Siskel and Ebert. YouTube stole Siskel and Ebert style No, I think rating. they did stars, maybe. What did? Siskel and Ebert. No way. They did thumbs up, thumbs, thumbs up, up, thumbs down. I believe so. All Let's right. go We're to gonna Siskel start, and Ebert. We're going to start the rest podcast. In, rest in, hey, rest, in, rest in, uh, in pieces, my gods. Are they both dead? I hope so. And by that, I mean only because I just rested them in peace. I don't want to rest somebody in peace that's alive. That's kind of disrespectful. How do you feel about the new the trend of resting in power? Ooh, I mean, no, because like power takes, again, I like the rest in peace because it's like life is already hard enough. Yeah. You know what I mean? Take it's a, a break. Take a break, you know, like yeah. be a little, have a little, it's a relaxing time. You know, you're laying down unless, unless you're buried standing up. If you're buried standing up, then it's like rest in power. Like that's a power move right there. Kind of like a standing desk. Like a, you walk like a, into a CEO's office, they're at a standing desk. They're like, exactly. I never rest. Right, right. I like that. My body never rests. My mind never rests. So that's a that's a huge power. I, you know, I'm going to actually think about that now getting buried standing up. Well, maybe it is short for rest in power nap. OK, so they'll be <laughs> coming back in three days. Jesus style. <laughs> maybe. OK. OK. I am on Siskel and Ebert and it. OK, yeah. Siskel and Ebert. Gene Siskel, who died in 1999, and Roger Ebert, who died in 2013. Now, if you had looked at them on the show, you would have assumed Ebert's dying first. Heart attack. What? <laughs> For sure. For sure. The Vegas, be- the Vegas odds on <laughs> Ebert dying first were huge. Much higher. Yeah, yeah. So, collectively known as Siskel and Ebert, were American film critics known for their partnership on television lasting from 1975 to Siskel's death in 1999. Siskel and Ebert's reviewing style has been described as a form of Midwestern populist criticism rather than the one form through essays which other critics, including Pauline Kael, felt undermined and undervalued the profession of film criticism. They were criticized for their ability to sensationalize film criticism in an easygoing, relatable way. Whoa, that's that's nuts. Hold on. They were criticized? The critics were criticized? Film critic critics. Whoa. Yeah. It's like, who watches The Watchmen? Mm. Who, criti- who criticizes the critics? The critics. I guess. Still critics. I guess so, yeah. yeah. Wait, and then, okay, so then when Cisco died, uh, was he, wasn't he replaced with somebody else? Wasn't it? I don't think so because their partnership. Actually, I think so. Right, there I forget. Was I forget his guy. name. Wasn't it Roger? Well, no, I thought it might have been Roger as well. Roger and Ebert. No, that's Roger and name. Roger. They became Roger and Roger, and boy, did they receive criticism for that. <laughs> oh yeah, from the critics because he wore a Cisco like face. He put Cisco face on. <laughs> Like Silence of the Lambs. Yeah. A movie that they loved. Okay, so... Two thumbs up, I believe. Can we try to find out what their review system was? I'm telling you, it's thumbs. I, it's, the, it's the digit that, that made us human. It's I'm, the thumbs. I'm not... I think so, too. Okay, known for their sharp and biting wit, intense professional rivalry, heated arguments, and their binary, quote-unquote, thumbs up, or thumbs down summations, Whoa. the duo became a sensation in American popular culture. How do you uh, feel about that rating system? 
I love it. It's simple. Pass it's, or fail. Pa- pass or fail. I love it. Just like most of my high school classes. I love it. It's most of your high school <laughs> classes are pass or fail. I told them when I got in first day, I was like, just give me the pass or fail. Look, I don't even, I don't <laughs> I'm going to be on the edge of F or D either way. So let's just make it a pass or fail. Give me a pass or fail. And I most see. of them are passed. So good for you. Uh, let's see. So we never answered my question, though. Did they get did Cisco get replaced? OK, so we answered the question of the rating system. Thumbs up, which I believe it's a great uh, system because it's it's universal. Unless I believe it's in some country. Isn't there the thing like in some country, like a thumbs up means like F, F, F you, you, man. I don't know. I know like shaking hands with the with a certain hand is disregarded because like certain cultures that used to wipe with their left hand. Oh, right. Yeah. Right. Uh, wait, which hand was it again that I wipe with? <laughs> um, all right. Shake right. Wipe left. Let's just, oh, let's just right. bump in the COVID world. Let's just bump. Yeah. And then is the bump also like uh, is the fist when you fist somebody? Do they think it's r- disrespectful? Like is this is this my fi- I got to remember is this my wiping hand or is this my fisting hand? Right. <laughs> <laughs> I always get those confused. You gotta put that on a sticky note on at your standing desk. <laughs> That's a power move. I gotta, we gotta put that on a t-shirt, if anything. <laughs> wiping hand or fisting hand. Yeah. Okay, so aha. The main article I need to go to, I believe, is at the movies. Gotta believe. Does that sound familiar? Yes, yes. I used to watch that. At the movies, originally, Siskel and Ebert at the movies. Oh, not Roger and Roger. Ebert and Roper. Roper. Roper, yeah. Roper, okay. that Yeah, I'm not a fan of Roper. Really? I thought he seemed like a pretty nice guy. No, I mean, no. I just, you know, I, it's just a thing about me. I like it, the ori- I like it when it's the original cast. Of course, you know? of course. But... All right, well, let's dive into our actual topic of the day, Jason. I got something lighthearted, fun, exciting for you. You know, we already covered death and resting in power. (sighs) And this kind of goes into that. Okay, okay. I'm excited. Can I guess? No. Can you give me eight minutes to guess? I (laughs) cannot. Nope. My topic today is a four-penny coffin. A four-penny coffin? That's right. Mm, what is what can i take a guess what that is you cannot (laughs) can i get 15 minutes to guess (laughs) no you may not i'll just start by telling you tell me now a coffin it does sound like a little bit of what we covered right resting in power it sounds a little resting in peace death related for sure okay the four penny coffin or coffin house was one of the first homeless shelters created for the people of central london It was operated by the Salvation Army during the late 19th and early 20th centuries to provide comfort and aid to its destitute clients. For four pennies, a homeless client, it's interesting they call them clients, could stay at a coffin house. He received food and shelter. Moreover, he was allowed to lie down flat on his back and and sleep in a coffin-shaped wooden box. That's not a bad idea. I guess when I, when I get old, I would like to have like maybe like a king size coffin bed where it's just like I might just go out on my sleep. Yeah. So it's like why Let's make- move the body and do all this stuff like this whole rigmarole of, you know, uh, what is it? What is it called of um, doing the body? Burying Exhu- the dead? Exhuming? Exhuming? We covered it on an episode not too long I ago. I remember. I remember a little bit. <laughs> but not much. You don't remember much. Ex- I, I just mean the word <laughs> exhuming, right? Is that correct? No, exhuming is digging up the body, you dope. Oh, okay. Well, yeah, I don't want that. <laughs> you would run the worst <laughs> graveyard ever. <laughs> Your relative's body, we exhumed it just like you wanted. <laughs> I did, Ru, on a side note, I did see this pickup truck that was hauling a little like kid's toy, like R- RV, like car truck thing okay that had like a skull and had a badass like you know flames and stuff like that and it was and there was a big um sticker that says like grave digger the grave digger oh okay. and it's like and, but thing i thought about it, i was just like that's just a job that's not really like that badass about it like what you know it's kind of like the badass about it is putting somebody in the grave you I know think the it's the relationship to death okay kind of like like the Undertaker, the wrestler, right? right like right. he's gonna bury his opponents. Which, right? 
But I think, I guess, yeah. I but know. a grave digger, they're just digging the grave. Right. That's what I mean. And I believe it's a DMV uh, song, right? Grave digger. Yeah, they play that at the DMV on repeat. <laughs> DMB, Dave Matthews Band. <laughs> oh, Dave Matthews Band. I I'm allowed DMV. I'm allowed to say I'm allowed to I I know them, so I'm allowed to say DMB. Okay, I've been to enough concerts too. Uh, Jason, you're wrong. Do they not have a song called Grave Digger? No, well, I think they do. Okay, but a true Dave. Matthew band, Dave Matthews band head. Yeah, I didn't say I was a true Dave Matthews band head. You were indicating, you said, I can call them that. I can call because them Because I've been DMB. to two concerts. I believe they just call him Dave. They just call him Dave? Yeah. The whole band? They just call him Dave? They'll say, like, doesn't Dave have a song called Grave Digger? Because it's just understood who you're talking about. Well, I don't about. know. I don't know him that personally. Uh huh. You know? Told you. Yeah. <laughs> All right. We're back on Four Penny Coffin. For four pennies, a homeless client could stay at a coffin house. He received food and shelter. Moreover, he was allowed to lie down flat on his back and sleep in a coffin-shaped wooden box. Only on your back? The client was given a tarpaulin for covering. What's, I assume tarp, that's like a sheet? A tarp? A tarpaulin, or tarp, (laughs) is a large sheet of strong, flexible, water-resistant. So back in the day, I bet it was canvas or something. I think still in the day, it's canvas, is it not? No, you can get plastic tarps. You've seen boats. Oh, I mean, you can, but I'm just saying they have canvas tarps. Tarps are tarps, my friend. What made this unique is that it was the cheapest homeless shelter in London at the time that allowed its clients to lie down on their back and sleep. So maybe they did have standing sleep beds. Standing, like, (laughs) upright coffin beds. I have no idea. The Salvation Army also offered shelters that allowed its clients to sleep on a bed for a much higher price. Hence, the coffin house was popular because it offered an economical and mid-range solution for homeless clients looking for relief from the cold. So just to be clear in their pricing structure, this is mid-range. I assume cheap is just out on the (laughs) streets. (laughs) <laughs> That's what Wiki is saying. Yeah, where's the wait? Where's the five star coffin <laughs> uh, Salvation well, that's Army the bed. motel? That's the bed. Mm. Compared with modern examples, the shelter is considered inadequate. It so was, there wasn't a, like a continental breakfast in the morning. What does complement a coffin? I assume London. You got to go just like a tea. You get like tea. Tea from but like. Not like just rainwater tea. Yeah, it's they heat up rainwater. Yeah, <laughs> it's got flavor, but not the kind you want. Right, right, and there's and that's the the flavor comes in from the rain. There's no actual. Yeah, the tea. roof runoff right. is <laughs> that's little little grit. In roof there. runoff. That's another uh, Dave Matthews Band song. DMB. Yeah, DMB. Well, I, was, oh, I didn't know you know him like that. Compared with modern examples, this shelter is considered inadequate. It was, however, considered an inexpensive and compassionate attempt to deal with the relatively new problem of homelessness. This shelter provided relief from the harsh London winters and was viewed by many at the time as having the benefit of attracting new followers to Christianity. It always goes back to Christ, baby. I love when I just want to have a warm place and some shelter, and I change my whole belief system the next morning. <laughs> I've, I mean, I, look, now I know why they have it uh, in coffins. They want to send you back to Christ. They want to either yeah. wrap you up and say, hey, you want to meet Christ? Hop on here. Four <laughs> <Yeah>. pennies. <laughs> we'll just slide the lid on, and you'll meet your Savior. Yeah, like a Tupperware. So, Jason, that's the end of the article. Well, that's a wonderful article. Where should we go here? <laughs> we can go anywhere. We could go to DMB. With, with Christ? Oh, DMB. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You want to go to Dave Matthews, man? Yeah, let's do it. Let's see what this Gravedigger song. Can I ask, what is your relationship with Dave Matthews, man? <laughs> I used to just, in high school, I used to go tailgate, uh, tailgate uh, his concerts for some tail. Would you go into the concert? Nah, I was barely into him. I was more about into the ladies who listened to that band. Oh, well, you would have fit in right at my high school. Nice. Dave Matthews Band, also known by the initialism DMB, 
There you go. See? Is an American rock band formed in Charlottesville, Virginia in 1991. The band's founding members are well, singer-songwriter we hey, we talk about Charlottesville. and guitarist Dave Matthews, bassist Stefan Lassard, drummer and backing vocalist Carter Buford, violinist and backing vocalist Boyd Tinsley, and saxophonist Leroy Moore. Do you want to go to their history? How much time? Do we want want to really spend dedicate to, with Dave, Dave Matthews here? I mean, Dave. It he's, depends if we're gonna jam out for a little bit. Could be a while. He's he's Virginia's um, Jesus Christ. A jam band, Dave Matthews Band, is renowned for its live shows. The band is known for playing songs differently each performance. This practice has become a staple of their live shows since the early. 1990s. It no. was like a, it was like a snowflake. I always remember saying that that band is a snowflake. Each each, each uh, performance, performance is different. Is a like little a different. Like yeah. a snowflake. Yeah, they're all snowflakes. Yeah. So this is their formation. Songwriter David John Matthews, working in Charlottesville, Virginia, as a bartender at Miller's Bar in November 1990, became a friend of a lawyer named Ross Hoffman. Hoffman convinced Matthews to record a demo of the few songs Matthews had written and encouraged him to approach Carter Buford, a local drummer on the Charlottesville music scene. <laughs> Who's this lawyer that's just going around to bartenders being like, you should record a demo? Hey, this is, you know what? I like that guy. For a lawyer, pretty nice dude for just going out there and like uh, really um, uh, motivating people. Or... Do you even play an instrument? I don't nah. care. Record a demo. <laughs> But then he got in because the contractually, he got some. He got some on on the you back end. You know what I mean? He, he signed put those enough con contracts. Yeah, Something's he was like, let me, he was like, let me put this contract together for you, and I'll get a nominal fee. You know. After hearing Matthew's demo, Carter agreed to spend some time playing the drums both inside and outside the studio. Matthews also approached Leroy Moore, another local jazz musician, who often performed with the John De Earth. Quintet to join them. There's no way a Quint band called the John to Earth Quintet is going to make it big. So good move on his part. Quintet. That's five. Eleven. We'll never know. No, five is pentet. Pentet. But I think it's all. T all right. It's a group containing five members. Ah. Why do you question your professor? It's always good to question everything. As a student, I know that. The trio began working on Matthew's songs in 1991. Matthews recollects that, quote unquote, the reason I went to Carter was not because I needed a drummer, but because I thought he was the baddest thing I'd ever seen. And Leroy, it wasn't because I desperately wanted a saxophone. It was because this guy just blew my mind. At this jazz place I used to bartend at Miller's, I would just sit back and watch him. I would be serving the musicians fat whiskeys and they'd be getting more and more hosed, but no matter how much, he he used to still blow my mind. And it was the sense that everyone played from the heart. And when we got together and they asked, what do you want the music to sound like? I said, I know this is a song I wrote, and I like what you guys play, so I want you to play the way you react to my song. Hmm. Interesting. There was a lot of breaking our inhibitions. Yeah, because they were, they were all uh, hosed up. Yeah, as he puts drinking it. fat whiskeys. Yeah. Okay. Let's fast forward a little bit. This is a long article written by a fan. For years, it was believed sure. that the band's first public show was April 21st, 1991 at Charlottesville's Earth Day Festival. On October 9th, 2010, Stefan Lassard reported via Twitter the discovery of an earlier show. Taped March 14th, 1991 at Trax, a local music venue. The show was a benefit for the Middle East Children's Alliance and included the following songs. Typical Situation, Best of What's Around, I'll Back You Up, Song That Jane Likes, Warehouse, Cry Freedom, and Recently, All DMB Bangers. All DMB Bangers. Uh, yeah, I was... Not too much into those <laughs> bangers at all. Why don't we move? There was a few that I did enjoy, like Gravedigger, to be honest. And that was like late in the game and well, not that well received, I believe. But. I believe you are 
Right. My brother was super into Dave Matthews, okay. which made me not super into Dave Matthews. He's a Dave head. Until I met a girl that was super into Dave Matthews. <laughs> then I was like, I'm back in. <laughs> Okay, so do you want to go to something else here, Jason? Uh, yeah, let's... The true Dave heads can... They know the history. They and everyone yeah. else is like, nah. I will say, I did enjoy the use of his song in Lady Bird. Oh, I haven't seen it. Oh, okay. No spoilers there. No spoilers. Yeah. They, so they played Gravedigger in Lady Bird? No, get off of Gravedigger. <laughs> no one's played Gravedigger in any situation. I'm playing Gravedigger on my funeral <laughs> while they're burying me in the same bed that I died in. They played the song Crash Into Me. Oh, yeah. okay, yeah. I, I know that song. Not a fan. Well, I think it has gotten a lot of heat over the years as maybe being a little cheesy. Mm, okay. And Lady Bird used it in a very sincere way. Okay. Good movie, I think. Did a car crash happen? No, it's about two lovers, I believe. Uh, I thought it was about two vehicles hitting each other. Okay, so what should we go to, Jason? Did anybody else from uh, Charlottesville come into pro uh, prominence? You mean just in general? Yeah. There is a separate article called List of People from Charlottesville, Virginia. Okay. But let's start here. Since the city's early formation, it has been home to numerous notable individuals from historic figures, Thomas Jefferson and James Monroe, to literary giants. Wait, TJ's from... Charlottesville. Like I mean, he was it's born there? well known that he... No, I don't think he was born there. Oh, okay. So then he was probably born in Britain, right? So what did did TJ go to? Uh, did he Monticello, go to Monticello. But Monticello is not. That's in Charlottesville. It is? Yeah, his home. He lived in Charlottesville. Oh, I just thought he went to UVA. Come on, Jason. I think he helped design UVA. I can see that. Yeah. Why can you see that? <laughs> Why can you see that, Jason? Because there's a statue of him there. His resting place in power is at Monticello, Virginia. Oh, does it have its own zip code? Monticello is a whole different... Yeah, that's TJ, what I thought. TJ was not born in Britain. He was born in Shadwell, Virginia, British America. At the time, it was called British America. It was it called now, it's, now it's called America's America. Okay, Monticello was the primary plantation of Thomas Jefferson, a founding father and third president. Whoa, don't, who began, hey, don't say that word. Don't say who plantation. Who began please. designing Monticello after inheriting land from his father at age 14. Man, if I inherit, I don't know what I would do. I was 14. I just inherit like acres and acres. And Ooh. you're like, time to start designing because I know nothing. Yeah. Although at 14, everything was fast forwarded by then so or back then. Meaning? You know, the lifespan was like maybe 45 if you're lucky. Okay. I imagine if you inherited land at 14 and you got to you want to start designing it. It's not like you're, you know, sketching things in your coloring book like kids now. I mean, 14-year-olds are still working on coloring now, hey, right? Hey, hey, I was I'd be honest with you. I was 14. I was still doing a couple coloring books. I believe it. Now they got adult coloring books. So Oh, yeah, that's true. Yeah. You got to blow off some steam. Yeah. And you do it by way of color. Okay, I'm back on notable people from Charlottesville. Okay. Edgar Allan Poe and William Faulkner. Hey, uh, easy there. As well as multi-billionaires John Klug and Edgar Bronf... Bronfman Sr. Oh, John Klugman. Do you okay. know who John Klug is? <laughs> no, but what do you do? How's he a billionaire? Yeah, 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 yeah. Tech? I don't think so, because he was born in 1914 and died in 2010, was a German-American entrepreneur who became a television industry mogul in the United States. At one time, he was America's the richest America. person in the U.S., Klug's major move into media was by purchasing stock in Metropolitan Broadcasting Corporation, MBC? He saw, he saw the big picture, baby. In the mid-1950s, the Metropolitan Broadcasting Corporation was the successor of the Dumont Television Network, which was spun off from Dumont Laboratories after the television network ceased operations in 1956. Metropolitan Broadcasting consisted of two stations, WABD in New York City and WTTG in Washington, D.C., both 
former DeMont outlets now operating as independent stations. Klug joined the company as its board chairman and largest stockholder in 1958, acquiring the bulk of his shares and founder Alan B. DuMont for about $6 million. So it sounds like he was wealthy a little bit before that. That's what, I, that's what I would like to do is be one of those wealthy people who like <laughs> nobody knows about, you know? Oh, who just has $6 million and yeah. then you're like... Okay, I don't need to go on yeah. Shark Tank. Let me just be a shark. Exactly. I don't. I don't need all the uh, the glitz and glamour. You know, you just sit back, relax, and, and cha ching your way up until you know you, you're dead in your coffin bed. Your four penny coffin. Your four penny <laughs> coffin bed. I mean, that's how most uh, wealthy people get are become wealthy because they're not so extravagant in mm. their in their um, coffins. <laughs> In 1986, Klug sold the Metro Media Television stations to 20th Century Fox, then controlled by News Corp for a reported U.S. $4 billion. Those stations would later form the core of what would become the Fox Television Network, which launched on October 9th of that year. It's crazy how, like, Fox became a channel, like, late in the game. Like, I didn't know, because by the time I was born... Fox was already like was a, cha- a channel like that where I watched that I honestly enjoyed a lot. Like Married with Children was on there. Well, I believe Fox would push the envelope a little more with, uh, with their bigger risks. With their like programming. the Simpsons. Right. Married with Children. I didn't know Married with Children was Fox. But... Oh, yeah. That's a huge Fox. That's and a then Fox I boy. think they also had more minority programming, too, initially. Right, right. Is that true? I don't know. In my eyes, yeah. Yeah, but, you're, a, but your uh, your eyes are white. So they're very <laughs> white, and so, you know, I noticed. But, no, hold on. Like, Okay, I remember watching Fresh Prince. That's NBC. Fresh Prince. Cosby Show back in the day, which I did not watch. Never also liked NBC. It. Was also NBC. That's true. Um, well, after Klug sold his networks, the following year, Forbes placed him on the top of its list of the richest man in America. Wait, how long has Forbes been going on? Forbes. Oh, jeez. All right, we're going to Forbes, and then I think we should wrap up here. Oh, hey, always wrap up. Forbes is an American business magazine owned by Integrated Whale Media Investments and the Forbes family. Published eight times a year, it features blah, blah, blah. Let's go to history here. They're published eight times a year. How is that divided in a year, in a 12-month year? Eight times. Twelve <laughs> divided by eight. I don't know. I'm not a genius. Every six weeks, I guess, or something <laughs> like that. We'll never be able to compute this. B.C. Forbes, a financial columnist for the Hearst Papers. Oh, worked for Hearst. And his partner, Walter Dre, the general manager of Magazine of Wall Street, founded Forbes magazine on September 15th. 1917, Forbes provided the money and name, and Dre provided the publishing expertise and beats. The original name of the magazine was Forbes, devoted to doers and doings. Yeah. (laughs) Hell yeah. Nice. (laughs) That was before Playboy, huh? I guess, yeah. Dre became vice president of the B.C. Forbes Publishing Company while B.C. Forbes became editor-in-chief, a post he held until his death in 1954. B.C. Forbes was assisted in his later years by his two eldest sons, Bruce Charles Forbes, also B.C. Forbes, and Malcolm Forbes. M. Forbes. M. Forbes, yeah. So do you want to know anything else, or are we good? I think we're good. Think- oh, geez, I turned into Mark Marin. So we good? <laughs> now we're good. Now we've. Hey, uh, folks, we've uh, learned everything we can. Can you unlock the gates now? <laughs> unlock the gates. Does he have a speech impediment? He does. Kind. Of, he's got. Does a, he really? He's got a um, a thing. Yeah. Now he would be somebody that would be opposed to the stand up coffin because he likes to sit down. During, mm. Even during stand-up. Well, we never discussed a stand-up coffin, so... What do you mean? We talked about the laying down coffin. I said standing up coffin is a power move. Okay. <laughs> All right. Yeah. <laughs> Mark Marin would like a standard coffin. Standard coffin? All right. 
Can we just wrap this up? You're driving me nuts. Let's do it. Yeah. You have the power to wrap it up. I don't know why you have to have, you have to give, do I have to sign a permission slip to wrap it up? You do. I wanted to know if you wanted to know anything else and you don't. So that's the episode, folks. Signing off. Thank you guys uh, once again for joining us on this delicious trip (laughs) down Knowledge Lane. Uh, And I welcome you to like, subscribe, and also remember to join us next week. And please do not forget to review us. Two thumbs up. Uh, Well, you can't do that on YouTube. Maybe one thumbs up, but really in your heart heart. is two thumbs up. Right in the comments, second thumbs up. That's Hey, that's not a bad idea. Not a bad idea. Yeah. Yeah. Follow us on TikTok and Instagram at Wiki University. Bye. Give me those digits. <laughs>